Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, and welcome to the Pentelec ABA webinar on a financial approach to tackling modern slavery imperatives for governments, regulators, banking, and financial services. Uh, I'm joined uh, by Andy Shen. Hi, Andy. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sharish. Uh, great to see you, Andy. Um, so at the outset, uh, let me thank the Asian Bankers Association, uh, especially Amador and Make, for partnering with us again for this webinar and helping to bring this issue uh, to the notice uh, of the ABA members and others. Uh, thanks also to the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership that aims to put the financial sector at the heart of global efforts to end modern slavery and human trafficking and is based within the United Nations University Center for Policy Research, uh, which is represented by Andy here today. Um, so as we all know, uh, finance serves as a major stimulus for criminals as they derive profits from the exploitation of others. It also serves as an important source of leverage through which investors can uh, influence businesses to address cases of human trafficking and other forms of modern slavery with which they are linked or to which they contribute. Uh, at the same time, the insufficient finance also serves as a major point of vulnerability for victims, while access to useful and affordable financial products and services can actually serve as a crucial source of support for survivors. It is therefore critical to incorporate a collaborative approach to prevent and respond to cases of human trafficking, modern slavery, and forced labor. Uh, these efforts are critically important at a time when the international community is mobilizing efforts to reach target 8.7 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDG. And given the important role played by governments, banks, and the financial sector in the fight against human trafficking, uh, learning from good practices can prove to be useful for individuals and organizations as they attempt to further progress towards attaining target 8.7. So the objective of today's webinar is to really throw light on this important subject uh, and also share some free learning resources that have been developed by the UNU that can help sensitize governments, banks, and financial institutions to equip themselves better in the fight against modern slavery. Uh, as usual, please enter your questions in the Q&A box and we will take them up at the end of the webinar. Uh, I would now like to formally welcome our speaker for today, Andy Shen, who is the government and multilateral organizations lead at the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiatives in the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. Uh, Andy, uh, welcome once again. And before I, you know, before we get into the conversation, let me just say a few words about you so that uh, the audience gets to know you. Um, so Andy has uh, more than a decade of experience in, uh, you know, fighting forced labor, human trafficking, and labor migration, and is an internationally recognized expert on human rights in industrial fisheries, uh, business and human rights, and international labor standards. Andy previously worked with the International Labor Organization and the International Labor Rights Forum as a legal and policy advisor. He has also served as a legal consultant at a Cambodian anti-trafficking organization where he supported Cambodian lawyers who represented hundreds of survivors of labor trafficking. So uh, Andy, welcome once again. And um, you know, to kick this off, uh, can you first give us an introduction about the FAST UNU initiative, as well as a background of the target 8.7 of the United Nations SDG and its significance to the government as well as the private sector. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sharish. And I just want to start off by thanking you again, thanking Fintelect and the Asian Bankers Association and for all of you who are here today uh, participating in the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, FAST, or Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, as Sharish mentioned, is a multi-stakeholder initiative based at UN University Center for Policy Research. The work we work to mobilize the financial sector against modern slavery and human trafficking. For those of you who may not um, be aware of UNU. Uh, we are the think tank of the UN system. And so we provide policy advice and support, research support uh, to various uh, UN system entities, um, as well as other stakeholders. Uh, and, and for us, it's pertaining to the issues of modern slavery and human trafficking. In 2018, the Liechtenstein Initiative for a Financial Se Sector Commission on Modern Slavery and Trafficking was established to consider how the financial sector can be placed at the heart of global efforts to address these crimes. 25 commissioners were appointed, consisting of financial sector leaders, survivors of trafficking, 
representatives from global trade unions, civil society organizations, government regulators, and UN bodies. In 2019, the commission released the blueprint for mobilizing finance against slavery and trafficking. This blueprint is the founding document of FAST, which we now work to implement through the, through the many recommendations in the report. FAST currently works in partnership with many different entities around the world, including the private sector, government regulators, survivor support organizations, and policymakers. We have four work streams that cover governments and multilateral organizations, the private financial sector, including investors and banks, vulnerable populations, and financial sanctions and asset freezing. Our areas of work address the financial sector's primary connections to modern slavery and trafficking, namely investments, loans, and insurance, to the handling of proceeds of the crimes, and financial exclusion as a risk multiplier for vulnerable populations. As Sharish mentioned, FAST aims to accelerate action on target 8.7 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. As many of you probably know, the 17 SDGs were adopted in 2015 by the UN General Assembly, and they cover the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, and they're rooted in the principle of leaving no one behind. Target 8.7, which falls under Goal 8, which is about decent work for all, is a commitment by member states to take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery and trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including the recruitment and use of child soldiers, and by 2025, and child labor in all its forms. As we're now in 2023, only seven years um, from the end date of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, it's a time of reflection at the midpoint of these goals. Um, and sadly, you know, we're not on track to achieve target 8.7. The latest global estimates of modern slavery by the ILO, IOM, and Walk Free show an increase of nearly 10 million more people in modern slavery than five years ago. So this is a very troubling development. The private sector, alongside government and civil society, is key to ending modern slavery and trafficking. The global estimates of modern slavery show that 86% of forced labor cases are imposed by private actors. And forced labor touches virtually all parts of the private economy. The G7, the G20, the General Assembly, and the Security Council of the UN have all called on governments to partner with the private sector to address these issues. Quite frankly, without the private sector, including the financial sector's active participation in addressing these issues, it will really be impossible to achieve SDG target 8.7 in the current timeframes. Um, so I'll stop there and hopefully that addresses thanks. your, your uh, question. Thanks, uh, Andy, for that uh, background and, uh, you know, for drawing out the significance of what uh, we're going to speak about today. So, uh, you know, Andy, what would you say is the role that is required to be played by the various stakeholders, you know, whether it's governments, banks, uh, or the financial sector in this fight? And uh, what is it that can help us get closer towards attaining uh, target 8.7? Uh, what do you see uh, other gaps that presently exist? And also, you know, what would you say is the role of uh, public-private partnerships uh, to achieve uh, the goal? Thank you, Sharish. Great question. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it really takes a whole society effort to achieve SDG target 8.7, whether that's governments, private sector, civil society, um, everyone has an important role to play. For governments, uh, the primary responsibility is regulation, providing guidance, convening, capacity building, including for the private sector, implementation and enforcement of law. The financial sector's role really depends on its connection to trafficking and the other forms of modern slavery. If it's through investments, loans, and insurance, human rights due diligence is critical to preventing and addressing modern slavery and trafficking. If it's through the handling of the proceeds of crime, suspicious activity reports and other anti-money laundering measures, including cooperation with govern governments in freezing, seizing, and confiscating illicit assets is our key. And ensuring financial inclusion for survivors of trafficking is also very important to prevent re-exploitation and to ensure once they are awarded compensation that they can actually receive it and, and, and uh, effectively use it. PPPs are crucial in the fight against trafficking because financial intelligence is crucial to the detection of these crimes. However, financial intelligence requires indicators and knowledge of both the operational and strategic nature of the crimes that can be exchanged and developed in a trusting environment between the public and the private sector actors. PPPs are also crucial because there's a certain authority uh, to create anti-human trafficking or modern slavery standards for the respective national financial sector. Standards that due to the composition of these PPPs fully understand the needs of the law enforcement while taking into account the practicality of implementation by financial institutions, which is very important. 
There are already many examples of PPPs around the world dedicated to the issue of human trafficking. So a few that I will highlight are JM Lit in the UK, AFCA in Germany, and SAMLIT in South Africa. So fast, we were just in South Africa in December uh, at a conference that was co-organized and hosted by SAMLIT. And um, pleased to see that they're taking uh, great steps forward on, the, on tackling this issue. And many of the other countries in the, around the world are considering or are in the process of establishing modern slavery, human trafficking, PPPs. Uh, FAST is um, happy to provide support, um, and if there are other governments uh, around the world that are interested in doing so, please feel free to reach out to us about that. Right. Um, so, uh, Andy, you know, in many countries, uh, you know, the national risk assessment uh, that is done once every few years, uh, that does not really uh, highlight the risk of modern slavery and human trafficking uh, or even wildlife trafficking, right? And because of this, uh, I believe the government agencies uh, and the you know, different sector regulators do not actually uh, actively encourage banks and financial institutions to implement the required red flag indicators. And what happens because of this is uh, there is a lack of uh, suspicious activity reports or suspicious transaction reports uh, that have to be filed uh, so that you know, they can be disseminated uh, to the uh, relevant agency. Now, what uh, could be the solution to this problem? And are there any action items that you would suggest uh, that government agencies and institutions that have authority over the financial sector uh, actually implements uh, this in a proactive manner? Thanks for that question, Shuris. This is a, a very important issue for FAST. Um, we, are, we recognize, uh, and through our work, through our research, through uh, the anti-money laundering experts on our team, that NRAs uh, are really at the heart uh, of some of these uh, challenges that, we, that we, we, we've seen, observed in terms of governments tackling uh, human trafficking through the anti-money laundering measures. Um, in, in fact, currently not many countries do address human trafficking comprehensively in their NRA. Last December, uh, just a few months ago, uh, I'm sorry, about a year, a year and a few months ago, FAST conducted an analysis of a sample of 27 NRAs globally covering every region of the world. What we discovered is that only eight NRAs out of the 27 address human trafficking comprehensively. And what we mean by comprehensive is that they deal with the topic more in depth by creating a dedicated chapter on it. And even in the NRAs that do address human trafficking and modern slavery, the figures relating to the crime, such as suspicious activity reports, investigations, or convictions are extremely low. And this is especially concerning considering the estimated 50 million people in modern slavery currently, and the estimated annual profits of around 150 million billion US dollars for forced labor. Because human trafficking and modern slavery is not adequately addressed in NRAs, it's therefore not a priority in the country's fight against money laundering, terrorism financing, and its predicate offenses, including trafficking. This results in the financial sector not focusing on trafficking, and this leads to a lack of data and information on these crimes. This in turn means that human trafficking will remain a low priority for governments. So in order to break this vicious cycle, what we call a vicious cycle, FAST is currently undertaking several activities. These include collaboration with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Council of Europe, which are the three largest NRA methodology providers for countries, in order to develop a guidance on how countries can better address trafficking in their NRAs. The guidance report will highlight good examples where countries do address human trafficking in their NRAs, including some countries in sub-Saharan Africa. The guidance report will be published in the first half of this year, and the timing is ideal because in one and a half years from now, there will be the fifth round of evaluation of the FATF uh, that will commence. And this means that at that time, many countries will consider updating their NRA. So hopefully this guidance that we'll be producing in collaboration with these methodology providers will inform and hopefully result in more NRAs, including human trafficking in the future. We're also organizing a series of roundtables events for financial sector actors in, in order to raise awareness of human trafficking, especially among financial institutions, and to discuss and develop red flag indicators for the countries involved. So far, FAST has organized seven roundtable events and reached out to around 500 participants in the financial sector. And lastly, I want to mention that we're developing an online training course specifically for FIUs. So this course will, uh, will be adapted from the e-learning course that I'm presenting on today, that, that's more for government officials broadly. And it'll be released later this year. It's done in cooperation with the Egmont Group. And the FIU course will aim to strengthen the capacity of FIUs and then share, and so they can then share their knowledge with the private financial sector. 
as well as with other authorities in government. And lastly, I just want to mention that in addition to these activities, uh, we believe it's important for governments to ensure that their NRAs are aligned with uh, any national action plans on business and human rights or national action plans on trafficking in persons or anti-modern mo anti slavery or trafficking strategies in general. Uh, this means that NRA should consider high-risk sectors in their country. So I want to also just highlight here a report that we produced last year called Earth Shattering, which focuses on forced labor, child labor uh, in the cocoa uh, and artisanal gold sectors of Ghana. And so this is something that's an example of uh, research into high-risk sectors that they may inform NRAs. Right. Um, so Andy, another uh, you know point uh, that I wanted to discuss was you know protecting uh, current and potential victims. Uh, you know, and uh, you know how would you say uh, you know that we should encourage banks or financial institutions and even payment service providers, right, uh, to provide financial services to the vulnerable population, particularly to survivors of trafficking, uh, and at the same time adhering to the AML and CFT obligations. Are there any case studies uh, that you can share where this has been done successfully so that you know, the uh, financial uh, sector actors or in the uh, webinar today can actually get some ideas from that? This is a, a very important uh, subject um, that's, that we've been working on for many years. Um, you know, and our research has shown, uh, continues to show that uh, when survivors of trafficking are excluded from the formal, formal financial system that can increase their vulnerability uh, to being re-trafficked or to, to re-exploitation. Um, and at the same time, we recognize um, that there are sometimes a tension uh, there where uh, there needs to be compliance uh, with anti-money laundering um, uh, regulations. Um, and so therefore, uh, it's important to uh, have a, a multi-stakeholder collaboration to address uh, these twin issues. And so um, the Survivor Inclusion Initiative is a flagship program of FAST established in the UK, US, and Canada. And we have facilitated the opening of over 2,800 accounts for survivors. Lessons learned from this risk-based approach um, has supported banks to open accounts for other vulnerable groups, including refugees, domestic violence survivors, and homeless people. SIA resources, which I recommend all of you to, um, to uh, peruse at, at your convenience, can be found on the FAST website. And uh, to share uh, some, some good case studies and examples from around the world, um, there will be four that I will highlight, Canada, Mexico, Rwanda, and Egypt. So in Canada, it's a good example of how banks or survivor support organizations, supervisors, regulars have worked together for the past four years and established technical guidance or simplified due diligence so that survivors and other groups can gain access to basic banking. So recently, um, the Canadian um, regulator uh, announced um, the, the publication of this guidance uh, with the support of FAST, and we're very um, uh, excited to see that this has been now uh, uh, released and could potentially lead uh, to more uh, account, uh, bank account openings for survivors and other vulnerable populations. The case study on this particular project will be available on our website in a few months. In Mexico, the anti-money laundering regulation establishes low-risk deposit accounts at banks with simplified due diligence requirements, which are classified into three operation levels under certain service restrictions. This approach increases financial access for excluded groups. We are working with stakeholders in the country currently to expand this already thoughtful risk-based tiered banking system to support financial access for survivors, especially migrants and returnees. And our report on this initiative will be published in September. The last two are Rwanda and Egypt. So in Rwanda, refugees have had access to bank accounts since 2017. The central bank of that country allows the UN um, uh, HCR to, to show proof of with their proof of registration to act as a proxy KYC for refugees who do not have a government issued refugee ID. And lastly, in Egypt, the Egyptian Anti-Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Unit issued simplified due diligence measures for clients of financial inclusion products and services. And this allows for the opening of bank accounts for youth who are at least 16 years old. And so hopefully those are some uh, good illustrations, examples from around the world um, of how it can be done even though it can be challenging uh, through cooperation uh, with different stakeholders. Right, thanks, thanks, Andy. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we all agree that, you know, raising awareness uh, about context specific and sector specific uh, indicators of modern slavery uh, amongst the key actors, whether they are labor inspectors or financial investigators or FIUs 
or banks or investors, supervisors, you know, that is the need of the hour, right? And, you know, I believe uh, the new course that has been launched by the UNU, which you just mentioned, uh, addresses this need. So can you speak a bit about this uh, course, uh, this learning resource and how it will be beneficial to all the stakeholder communities, including the private sector uh, that's attending uh, today? Yes, thank you, Sharish, and thank you very much for the endorsement. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, in all regions of the world, including Asia Pacific, we believe there's insufficient knowledge among stakeholder communities, including civil society, including the private sector, the financial sector, including government authorities, about how the financial sector is connected to modern slavery and trafficking, and what governments and these other stakeholders can do about it. Um, considering that there's this lack of knowledge, um, FAST, with the support of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, worked on developing this e-learning program for the last one and a half years um, based on our FAST blueprint, which is, as I mentioned, the founding document for our project. And um, it was it's geared um, with uh, certain case studies uh, and other examples tailored for the Southeast Asia region, but I think broadly applicable to governments uh, around the world. Um, it, it provides a good um, basic um, explanation of what modern slavery is. It explains the connections to the financial sector, um, and it gives recommendations on how government authorities um, and others can address these issues. I want to mention that um, this course is publicly available. It's free, and uh, those who complete the course will receive at the end an issue, uh, a certificate of completion from FAST and UNUCPR. Uh, the course is currently online. Um, I believe uh, Sharish, your colleagues have shared uh, the link to the course. And so we encourage you, all of you, to take the course. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, you know, while it was primarily designed for government officials, we believe it can also be useful for other stakeholders, including and especially the private sector and the financial sector. States have the primary responsibility for protecting human rights, including the right to be free from forced labor trafficking and other forms of modern slavery. Uh, and many states have interagency bodies that coordinate anti-trafficking efforts, that in, um, but few that we have seen include authorities responsible for finance in these interagency bodies. The FAST e-learning program encourages, promotes, and facilitates a true whole of government approach to these issues by, by asking governments to incorporate the agencies responsible for finance into these interagency efforts. And we've observed also that it's not only the agencies responsible for finance, that um, can benefit from these courses, but also the traditional governmental actors like the Ministry of Labor, uh, the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs, um, the Ministry of Interior in certain countries um, that may not fully understand um, what financial regulators, financial supervisors, financial intelligence units, um, the stock exchanges, security exchange commissions can do um, to address the issues of trafficking and, and modern slavery. Um, that being said, the financial sector is instrumental to our collective efforts to achieve SDG target 8.7. We hope the course will inform financial sector entities that may not be very familiar with the topic of modern slavery or may only understand a certain specific aspect to it. Banks, for example, have long had anti-financial crime departments and increasingly are also um, uh, developing ESG invest investing departments to keep pace with international developments. These departments may both address modern slavery, but from different angles and in response to different regulations. We, we know that in many of these banks, the two departments tend to work in silos and seldom communicate with each other about modern slavery matters. Unlike uh, corporations, which often have a central um, uh, a body or central uh, a function to coordinate matters of modern slavery or coordinate matters relating to human rights, uh, banks we have seen um, have seldom have this central function or central body that coordinates um, uh, comprehensively across the institution. We believe that there, is, there can be benefit uh, from communications across departments. Uh, there may be uh, certain banks may wish to consider how data financial intelligence that's gathered for one purpose may also be used for other purposes. And there can also be learnings shared across the financial institution, for example, on how to engage with stakeholders like workers and their organizations. I also want to share that, um, you know, the e-learning course that we developed touches upon regulation uh, in, in different areas, for example, in, in global value chains, for example, with uh, social sustainability reporting. Uh, we've seen um, the trend now for at least in, in, the, in the Western world, in the EU, uh, in Australia, in the UK, in the US, 
there's, there's more discussion, there's more development of regulations uh, on these specific issues, including uh, on modern slavery uh, in global value chains and in the global economy. And so where regulation may be necessary as contemplated in this course, it's important. We believe it's important that the private sector, including the financial sector is informed and has the opportunity to provide input and share their experiences addressing modern slavery risk to result uh, ultimately in a, in a more effective regulation. Um, and we believe that compliance with these new regulations will be higher when the private sector understands the issues, supports the objectives, establishes partnerships with other stakeholders to address these issues and allocate sufficient resources to meet the requirements of the law. And so we hope that this course uh, will ultimately um, be beneficial. And, and uh, for those of you here listening today who are in the private sector, we encourage you, again, to take a look at the course. Well, thanks, thanks, Andy, uh, for that. And in fact, I've put in the um, course link in the chat box for the benefit of the audience. Uh, we will also circulate it later. And uh, you know that I've already started doing the course. I'm finding it extremely useful and very well researched and uh, very informative. Uh, okay, we, I think we have a message in the chat box saying that the link is not accessible. So I have, that's probably my mistake. I have probably put in uh, a wrong link, but we will make sure that the correct link comes out to you uh, in the post webinar email uh, that follows. So audience, um, we will uh, again send you the link to the course, uh, you know, the email that comes to you post webinar and you can access it there. Um, Andy, thank you so much for joining us today at this webinar. Uh, you know, it's a brilliant resource that your team has put together, and I think it's going to be very useful for uh, everybody in uh, uh, not just in Asia, but in uh, I'm sure in other countries as well. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, please don't hesitate, all of you, to contact us if you identify any opportunities for, for collaboration. We would welcome that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And also, let me say thanks to the Asian Bankers Association, to Meg and to Amador and the entire team there for supporting uh, this webinar and for highlighting uh, this topic to its members. And we look forward to working on the next webinar. Uh, that's it for now. And all of you have a good day. Bye. Thank you.